If you like Sherlock Holmes or Poirot or Scooby-Doo, this is the video for you. Today we are going to dive in the biggest murder mysteries in Hungarian history. This case involves politics, a love triangle, jealousy, and a lot of lies. Ooh. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel where we talk about Hungarian true crime stories. My name is Tima and today we are going to try to uncover um, well, a kind of an unsolved murder mystery. It's kind of solved, we have an idea of who it could have been, but nobody was ever convicted for anything. As always, stay tuned for the Hungarian word of the day at the end of the video. Now, let's get started. It was on the 10th of May, 1932, when a taxi stopped in front of the Hotel Bristol in Budapest at around 8 p.m. A short brunette woman holding an envelope got out of the car and rushed inside the hotel where she went to the reception and called for a man whose full name and title was Lord Lieutenant Colonel Femeter Jozef. So for the sake of this video and for the sake of simplicity I will just refer to him as the lieutenant. And she wanted to talk with him because the envelope was addressed to him. So the brunette lady gave the envelope to the lieutenant who opened it and was confused and baffled to see that the envelope was apparently completely empty. It contained nothing inside. It was just his name on the envelope and that's it. So the man got in the taxi with the woman and together they went to an apartment at number 2 St. Janos Square in Budapest. This luxurious ground floor apartment belonged to a very rich and affluent lady, a woman called Litke Kamani or Mrs. Litke. And in the apartment also lived her living housemaid and living personal hairstylist, who were a married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Butyan. Mrs. Butyan was also the brunette lady, who went to fetch the man at the hotel. Mrs. Litke was a notably beautiful 33-year-old woman who only wore her ex-husband's name out of formality because she indeed was divorced. She was extremely rich. Not only was her father a bank owner, they came from a noble bloodline. And when the lieutenant arrived to her apartment, she rushed to him crying and sobbing hysterically, saying that Gabor has killed himself. But who was Gabor? Captain Rutkai Gabor, who I'm going to call Rutkai, he was an army veteran in his younger years, but then after he quit serving in the army, he became a crown guard. That's right, he was one of those few select people who actually guarded the Hungarian coronation jewels in the Buddha castle. If you have been in Hungary, in Budapest, I'm 100% sure you have been in this area of the city. It's by far the number one most touristic place in the entire country. He was in his prime years at the age of 39 and he was notably handsome. He was also a strong, robust man. He was about 190 centimeters and 105 kilograms heavy. That is about 6 foot 2 tall and 230 pounds heavy. And that is an important detail. So when Mrs. Litka came crying and hysterical to the lieutenant, telling him that their mutual friend had just died like less than an hour ago in her apartment, the lieutenant rushed straight to the scene. And when the lieutenant opened the door to the salon slash living room, he saw his friend dying, slouching off of a sofa. Now imagine it that he was sitting in the sofa at one point, but then he slouched off the sofa so that he was sitting on the ground, though his back and his head was still resting on the sofa. The lieutenant said, that he saw Rutkai's service gun right beside his body on the ground. He had an obvious gunshot wound in his forehead 
and when the lieutenant came to him, he was technically still alive, though very close to dying. He then took Rutkai into his hands and laid him on the floor, thinking that this would help him. And then the lieutenant ran somewhere in the neighborhood to fetch his friend, who was a doctor. And with the doctor, they rushed back to the apartment. And at that point, Rutkai was still alive. The doctor examined Rutkai's body. And in his written statement, he claimed that Rutkai must have been sitting in the sofa when he shot himself in the head, holding the gun to his forehead. And then from the impact of the gunshot, he somehow slouched off of the sofa when later the lieutenant repositioned his body to lie on the ground. Now let's stop there for a second as the number one discrepancy in the story. The doctor was not there to witness the lieutenant move Rutka's body to lie on the ground. The doctor had to have taken his friend, the lieutenant's word for it. But he has no evidence to actually support that Rutkai was not discovered in a lying position, or per se, that he was not killed in a lying position. The doctor only confirmed what the lieutenant said without actually having any kind of evidence for it. For all we know, it is entirely possible that Rutkai was, yeah, probably sitting in a sofa when he killed himself. He could have been sitting on the ground when he killed himself. He could have been lying on the floor or walking around. There is no way to actually know in which position he died and in which position he was then later repositioned. But that just seems like a minor insignificant difference for now. I'm gonna keep that for later. So literally, just within minutes that the doctor arrived and examined his body, the police, the military, forensic scientists, medical scientists and weapon experts came to the scene. Obviously, because Rutkai was a high status man working for the government as a crown guard, this was a big deal. And while the investigators were inside assessing the scene, Mrs. Litka was sitting crying on the porch trying to collect herself and answer all of the questions of the investigators. Her version of events was that Rutkai came to her apartment that afternoon at 3 p.m. and they stayed there and just hang out until 7 p.m. And around that time, Rutkai started having a very bad headache and he suggested going for a walk in the city for some fresh air. And besides having a headache, he also had a very important conversation to have with Mrs. Litke. And he really would have liked to do it in public while they were having a nice walk. So in order to walk, Rutkai made himself a little bit more presentable. He put on his hat and he fastened his sword on his side. Him being a crown guard, his attire always consisted of a sword and almost always a service gun. And Mrs. Litke being a proper, decent, honest lady, she went to the bathroom to change from her loungewear into her streetwear to look presentable while walking on the streets of Budapest. According to her, the tragedy must have happened while she was changing clothes in the bathroom. Because when she came out of the bathroom and went back into the salon, she saw Rutkai looking very, very pale and trying to walk in the direction of the sofa while also supporting himself on the coffee table. And at first glance, Mrs. Litke assumed that his headache must have gotten real bad, but then she soon realized that Lutkai was bleeding from the head. However, Mrs. Litke changed her story quite early on in the investigation, because the second time she was asked about what happened, she claimed that when she came out of the bathroom, Rutkai was already lying on the floor with a bleeding head. So that goes against what the doctor wrote in his written statement, confirming the lieutenant's version of events, that Rutkai was sitting in the sofa and then he slouched off because of the impact of the gunshot 
and then he was repositioned to a lying position on the ground. But now Mrs. Litkes says that at first she was walking and then collapsing onto the ground and then her second version of events is that he was already lying on the ground. So in Mrs. Litkes version of events he was never actually sitting on the sofa. But okay, maybe they were just also traumatized, they remember it differently. Interestingly, Mrs. Litke claimed that she never heard any gunshots whatsoever and neither did her mate, Mrs. Butyan, who was in a storage room next to the kitchen that was located on the other end of the apartment. So there were two people in the apartment and neither of them heard any gunshots, regardless of how far or near they were from the scene. The contemporary newspaper articles theorized that if the gun was held close enough to the skull, then it somehow could have muffled the noise of the gunshot enough so that nobody would hear anything. Though a gun expert who looked into this case recently claimed that that was impossible, especially with guns almost a hundred years old, it didn't matter how close you held it to someone's skull, it was impossible to muffle the sound so much that nobody would hear it even from the immediate area of the scene. Therefore we can assume that the ladies actually did hear the gunshot, and they just lied about it for some reason. But okay, let's continue according to the version of events of Mrs. Litke. She continued her story that now she was recounting to the police, saying that she was the one to give the empty but addressed envelope to Mrs. Butyan to deliver it at the Hotel Bristol to the lieutenant just a few minutes after 7 p.m. and that Mrs. Butyan was supposed to tell the lieutenant to come to the scene because Rutkai and the lieutenant were so close friends that the lieutenant just had to know the story from first hand. We also know that the envelope was addressed to the lieutenant in the handwriting of Rutkai and that the envelope allegedly did not contain anything. Now I can come up with two possibilities as to why the envelope would have been empty. First of all, Rutkai either was actually intending on writing a letter to his best friend, maybe a suicide note, we don't know, but he didn't actually get around doing it because he was in such a hurry to kill himself. That's an interesting possibility. The other possibility I have is that there was a letter inside the envelope, but somebody removed it before it could get to the lieutenant. And it makes you wonder who could have removed the letter, because the only two people had the opportunity was either the maid, Mrs. Butyan, or Mrs. Litke. I would find the second version way more feasible, because why would somebody be in such a hurry to kill themselves that they don't even finish writing a letter and then just send an empty envelope? It looks a lot more like there was something inside and then it went missing. I also have a third possibility, but more on that later. The investigators continued the investigation all night long and they kept questioning people until 6 a.m. the next morning. That was when they took Rutka's body for an autopsy and they closed the scene. The police continued the questioning the next day and they re-questioned the taxi driver, the maid and the security guard of the apartment building, but none of them could give the police any more new information. Unlike Mrs. Litke, as you could guess. This time around she changed her story again, saying that it was not the lieutenant who moved the body of Rutkai, but she was the one to move the body from a sitting position to a lying position all by herself, several feet away. Remember when I told you that Rutkai was a 230 pound or 100 kilogram heavy man? How did this tiny lady 
move this man around by herself. She explained it away that she had just such an adrenaline rush trying to help him that she was able to perform this superhuman strength. Which, okay, I'm not a doctor, I wasn't there, I don't know if it really happened. I guess it could have. But why would the lieutenant lie that he moved the body if he didn't? And why would Mrs. Litke say that she moved the body when she was obviously not able to? Not to mention that the investigators didn't find any kind of evidence that the body was moved at all. Why does this matter? Well, what we do know is that when the police arrived, Rutkai was lying on the floor and he had a gun shot to his head that looked like he was shot in the forehead and the bullet entered in the back of his head. But there was another possibility, even though the police wasn't able to confirm it for 100% certainty, that he was shot from the back of the head and the bullet exited on his forehead. And that could not have happened if he was sitting on a sofa where a headrest is above his skull. And since the police could not find any signs that the body was moved, there were no drag marks, there was no commotion, there was really no possibility for a skinny, weak lady to be moving around a man by herself, was it possible that Rutkai was somehow shot in the back of the head while he was facing the other way, standing. And then he collapsed onto the ground where he was ultimately found. I don't know, something smells fucking fishy to me. But okay, let's leave these tiny, minor and entirely irrelevant little details behind and move on. Because the next interesting piece of information that the police found fishy, to say the least. Why didn't Mrs. Litke, this gentle lady, scream and shout upon discovering that her friend is dying in her room, completely unexpected? Why didn't she call the police or a doctor immediately? Because if my friend was dying on my living room floor, my number one instinct would be to call for help and try to do something about it. But no, that is not what Mrs. Litke decided to do first. Because Mrs. Litke's first instinct was to call a taxi, send her maid carrying an empty envelope to the lieutenant who had no authoritative power in this case and his presence at the scene wasn't immediately necessary. Hmm, interesting. And okay, maybe you can explain it the way that she was so shocked and traumatized that she needed a friend to be with her and she just didn't know what to do, she didn't know what was the right thing, she didn't know she was supposed to call for a doctor, but that was not the reason that she gave to the police when they asked her the same question. She said that if she had called the police or a doctor, then a bunch of media reporters would have arrived at the scene and report on the tragic death of Rutkai. But if you ask me, that's some fucking weak ass bullshit reason, because the media reported on it anyway, she didn't prevent anything by not calling the police or the doctor herself. But the list of unanswered questions doesn't end there. You see, the investigators didn't fully understand why Rutkai would have suggested going on a walk, get ready, put on his hat, fasten his sword, and send Mrs. Litke to the bathroom to dress up so that he can take this unforeseen chance to quickly kill himself while no one is watching. Well, the newspapers had a weird answer to that as well, saying that Rutkai must have been preparing his suicide plan for so long that he had it prepared that he would make Mrs. Litke believed that they were going to go on a walk and her being a proper lady would go to a different room to get dressed. So apparently Rutkai would have known that he would be left alone in the room for a couple of minutes and he would take the chance to kill himself. 
but if somebody is suicidal I don't know much about this but if somebody is suicidal I don't think they would go out of their way this much to organize this huge plan to kill themselves in someone else's apartment you know but that is not the end of the craziness remember when I said that when the lieutenant discovered Rutka's body on the floor, he claimed to have seen his service gun right by his body. Well, during the questioning of Mrs. Litke, she said that Rutka did not bring his service gun with him that day. Though that was not going to be the end of it all, because he was such a regular in her home that he kept another secondary gun in one of her desk drawers in the salon and that must have been the weapon that he killed himself with conveniently but mrs litka didn't realize how much she was putting the halter around her own neck because when the police arrived to investigate the scene they did not find a weapon next to the body of rutkai they indeed found and collected a gun that was at the other end, the other corner of the salon, way far from him. So if he had killed himself, how did it magically fly across the room all the way to the corner? Not to mention that it was not his service gun or his secondary gun either, because it was a small caliber gun that was designed for ladies. I don't know much about guns, but I imagine it being smaller, lighter, more ornate, maybe easier to use, but it was indeed registered under the name of Mrs. Litke. Hmm, interesting. Now the brand is unknown because the contemporary articles kept reporting on all different kinds of weapon brands they could just not come to a freaking consensus on what brand it was but either way apparently mrs litke just so happens to own a gun that somehow ends up in rutka's hand and he conveniently kills himself in a matter of like two minutes while the only witness is away and nobody hears the gunshots but then the gun happens to fly out of his hand to the other corner of the room that makes perfect sense right there is nothing suspicious about this and apparently he was planning on this suicide for long enough to start addressing an envelope to his friend but didn't plan on it long enough to actually write a letter as the envelope was empty as we know but when i told you that this was an endless rabbit hole i meant it because now we are back at this weird missing letter next to rutka's dead body a piece of paper was found that contained only three words my dear Jozef. remember whose given name was Jozef? yes the lieutenant's so was that the missing letter from the empty envelope but where was the actual message other than the title of the letter nothing else was on the page unless it's some fucking invisible ink Ooh, maybe i don't know okay that's not part of the case but what if it was an invisible link <sighs> okay i'm getting way off track I'm just really wondering what this missing message could have been, what did Rutkai intend on writing in this letter and why was it cut short? Why didn't it go beyond my dear Jozef? Some sources say that it must have been a suicide note, but then somehow Rutkai halfway through writing his suicide note was like, yeah, fuck this, I'm not actually gonna write a suicide note to my best friend. Could be. Some other sources say that that single page was not the complete message. Maybe there are missing pages of this letter that are missing for a reason. Maybe they are missing because of some compromising information about an unnamed person. But who could have been that unnamed person and why would have it been compromising? Hmm, I wonder. But before I dive more into that, Furthermore, there was another letter found. You know where? 
in the shirt sleeve of Rutkai, tucked all the way up, hidden. And this letter was addressed to none other than Rutkai's wife and two children. Because that's right, Rutkai is a married man with a family. Now we don't know the contents of that letter, but it is supposed to be not a suicide note either. But then it makes you wonder what this married, handsome man doing in the flat of this unmarried, beautiful woman for hours on end. Well, I guess they weren't playing Monopoly for sure. Let's go back in time just a little bit. Remember when I told you that Rutka used to serve in the army and then he became a crown guard, where he used to live in the countryside where he owned about 200 acres of land. And Mrs. Litke also used to live in that same area of the countryside. And as much as I know, she was divorced by then, but honestly, who knows? And she had ties to the military because of her father. Remember when I told you that Mrs. Litke's father was a bank owner and came from an aristocratic family? So at one point their life paths crossed and these two people started an affair. That's right, you couldn't have thought that two young, rich and beautiful people are just friends. Nay nay. They were fucking. However, after a while, Rutkai started feeling really bad about himself for this affair and he was contemplating breaking up. But breaking up with who? Because some sources say that he wanted a divorce from his wife and leave his two children behind for his beautiful mistress. Some other sources say that he actually wanted to break up with Mrs. Litke and get back together with his family and make things right again. Because that's right, this love affair was no secret. A lot of people knew about this, including the wife and the children and the colleagues and the friends of Rutkai. Mrs. Rutkai said that her husband kept on promising that he would break off this affair with Mrs. Litke and he would get back together with her but he never really got around actually fulfilling this promise. It also didn't help his situation that at some point Rutkai's house, his family home where his children lived, was mortgaged and he fell into this spiral of debt. And you know who he had to borrow some money from? Yeah, the daughter of the bank owner, Mrs. Litke. So he was in this terrible situation when he supposedly wanted to leave his lover behind but then he was also owing her money and he was going bankrupt and he was gonna lose his house so this man got himself in some real deep shit now let's go one elevator stop deeper into this shit storm because Rutkai had a brother his name was Rutkai Elemir and he said that Mrs. Litke was a fucking psycho, like her entire life revolved around Rutkai. That they got to know each other in the countryside and when Rutkai was going to start his new job as the crown guard and he was relocated to Budapest, Mrs. Litke sold her house in the countryside and bought an apartment in Budapest to be as close to Rutkai as possible. But not any apartment. She bought the apartment that was literally facing across the street the barracks where Rutkai was going to work as the crown guard. Furthermore, Rutkai's wife claimed that she got multiple death threats from Mrs. Litke, saying that if she doesn't initiate the divorce, leave her husband, kick him out, then Mrs. Litke would kill her and her two children. So you see that she was totally a psychopathic side chick. So the police really started treating the death of Rutkai not as a suicide, but as a homicide. And they went to the scene and they really assessed the apartment. They tried to reenact all of the possibilities, trying to figure out the distance and the angle 
of how Rutkoi could have been shot. This was the time when the police ultimately figured out that Rutkoi's body was never actually moved. He died on the spot where the police found him later on. So both the lieutenants and Mrs. Litke's story of them moving him was bullshit. The police also determined that Mrs. Litke must have been either at the scene when the gun went off, because there was no way that the gun could have flown across the room, it must have been someone else to shoot him from a distance. And th there was just no way this was a suicide, the police was not buying it. Not to even mention that on the sofa, on which Rutgai was supposed to commit suicide, had a bunch of gunshots on it that looked like missed gunshots. And Mrs. Litke tried to explain this away, saying that when she got her little feminine revolver, she was just target shooting on her sofa to practice her targeting skills. Who the fuck does that? Doesn't matter how rich or affluent you are and how much disposable income you have to just be ruining your furniture, nobody practices target shooting inside their own home on their own sofa. Get it together, you bitch. It looked a lot more like somebody had tried to shoot Rutkai a couple of times before she got it right. Or a couple of times after she got it right. Maybe she tried to like make sure that he was dead. Maybe she tried to shoot him a couple of times. And after the police assessed the scene and tried to reenact all of the possibilities, Mrs. Litke apparently tried to flee to Vienna but she was stopped and her passport was confiscated. Now, I guess her being such a high-ranking and rich lady, she could have fled to Vienna regardless, even without her passport, but that is just another red flag for you. Now, you can see that there was mounting evidence and suspicion against Mrs. Litke. And, there, and the police had all of the witness testimonies and the inconsistencies and her suspicious behavior anyway. So she was arrested and she was taken to trial to decide whether or not she was guilty of anything. And when I'm telling you that this trial was sensationalized, I mean it. The entire aristocracy of Hungary was present and everybody was excited to see if she was gonna be found guilty. And she was not. She was acquitted of all charges and she was let go as a free woman. And you wanna know why? <laughs> Bitch. There are quite a few reasons. First of all, not only was she an aristocrat herself and she definitely had the connections, her daddy was a bank owner Okay, that definitely helped her case. People just couldn't believe anyway that this skinny, short and, and frail young woman would be capable of murder. No. And it's not even that there was not enough evidence against her, because there was plenty, circumstantial and not circumstantial. But to see the true reason for why she was not charged with anything, we have to go back 10 years prior to 1922. There was a very brief mention in a newspaper article that a man called Gömbös Gyula was challenging a man called Pronoi Pál to a duel. If you don't know what that is, back in the day, until like, yeah, like less than a hundred years ago, you could legally challenge someone to a duel and kill them if you couldn't settle your disagreements. You had to come to a specific place at a specific time with equal weapons, so neither of you had the upper hand, and whoever was able to kill the other person first was the winner of the duel, and therefore the winner of the disagreement. Like men used to do this when somebody hit on their girlfriend, or somebody challenged their political views, all kinds of bullshit reasons that nowadays you would be just fighting in angry Facebook comments. People used to kill over those. But I guess there must be a better explanation. I don't know, maybe it's just cultural. It was very, very prevalent in Hungarian history. 
but anyway both of the participants of the duel were allowed to bring a second and the second is your little helper or assistant why am I telling you all this? Because the second of Gumpers Jula was none other than Rutkai himself. And after winning this duel, they became like besties. They had a very close relationship. And Gumpers Jula was a politician. And his whole life he was preparing to become the prime minister of Hungary. Between the first and the second world war, Hungary was technically a kingdom, but we didn't have a king. We had a prime minister, and that was what Gumbes Jula wanted to become. So he was working on it with full force, and he was selecting his best man to be on his team. And one of his team members was allegedly supposed to be Rutkai, and he was supposed to be promoted to become state of secretary but with one condition. Gumbes Gyula allegedly told Rutkai that he would only promote him to state of secretary when he becomes prime minister if he broke off his love affair with Mrs. Litke. There you go! I just gave you the key to this whole mystery. If you paid attention, you can put the puzzles together right now. I'm gonna give you a second before I tell you the solution, okay? Got it? Okay, so let me tell you the whole shit that just went down and you didn't understand. Rutkai really wanted to become Secretary of State and he knew that he had to make the sacrifice of breaking up with his girlfriend, Mrs. Litke. She was a psycho and she was following around, stalking him all the time and he just had to break up with her in order to become the State Secretary. Even though he was going to go into even more debt and he was probably going to lose his family home, he knew that becoming the state secretary was going to solve his financial situation. So he had to make this final step. Now, this is why he acted like he had a headache so he could tell her that he wanted to go on a walk and have a fresh air outside while wanting to talk about a very important conversation. But either way, somehow he still ended up telling her the bad news while still at home. And upon hearing the news that he was breaking up with her, she just lost her shit and she just became this psycho jealous girlfriend. She took out her revolver and shot him in the back of the head while he was facing the other way. So it could have looked like he was shot from the front if he was sitting on the sofa, but in reality he was shot in the back of the head while standing. And then the reason why she didn't call a doctor was that because she had to stage it as a suicide. Now how was she going to stage it as a suicide? She was going to first of all tell her maid not to tell anybody that she heard the gunshots because there was no way they didn't hear the gunshots. And then the maid was instructed to take a taxi and go to the hotel with this envelope to summon the lieutenant. And all along we have thought that this envelope was empty, that it contained nothing else but the address to the lieutenant. But it is more likely that when the lieutenant opened the envelope, he saw that there was compromising information about him in the letter. Now, I don't know what kind of compromising information it could have been. Him being another high profile person, I'm sure he had some shit to hide. So he was blackmailed into going back to the apartment and help Mrs. Litke stage it as a suicide. Him being a stronger man, he was able to move the body of Rutkai to make it look like he was slouching over the sofa and not laying on the floor because that was key to make it look like it was a suicide and not a homicide. So then the lieutenant went to fetch his friend who happened to be a medical doctor to bring him back, somehow corrupt him and make him confirm the story in what body position he was found, in how he was killed, even though that was not the truth and the police later unearthed. And in the end, Mrs. Litke was obviously not going to be charged with anything on court because not only was she insanely rich and high profile aristocratic and noble, she was the daughter of a freaking bank magnet. She 
was also protected by the government. In the September of 1932, Gömpös Gyula did become the Prime Minister of Hungary and him as a Prime Minister could not afford the country to know that his would-be Secretary of State lived a double life and had a girlfriend who was a divorced rich lady while he was also married with two kids and it was in their best interest to not allow the media to know that Rotkoi was going to go bankrupt because all of his debts and that he owed money to the woman that she was seeing. <sighs> well, that is the end of this crazy story. Let me know what you thought about it. Did you find any other details or contradictions that I didn't elaborate on? Do you have any questions? Did I make everything as clear as possible? I really hope. Today's Hungarian word of the day is going to be for a love affair. In Hungarian it's viszony. This is S and this is N, so it's viszony. Love affair. A perfect fitting for this video. And for the engagement question for the sake of the algorithm, I would like to ask you what is something that you would really like to quit or get rid of in your life? For me, I really would like to quit being kind of self-conscious, not trusting my skills, not thinking that I am worth it to achieve big things. That's kind of a big deal for me. So what is it for you? Let us know down in the comment section. If you have made it this far into this video, you might as well like it. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I have gotten a few comments that my videos don't show up in your subscription box. So make sure to hit the notifications bell. So maybe you have more of a chance of actually getting to see my videos if you are interested in them. Thank you very much for watching and I see you next time. Bye!